all these kids in this grade. One more next week. One more next week. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. How many of you brought your Bibles with you? Well, I am concluding a series called In the Deep today. And I hadn't kind of planned on it, but I, we're going to conclude this today because I've got some other things I want to talk about. Anyway, so today we're talking about deep certainty. Deep certainty. And this is uh, from 1 John, and we're going to be reading from chapter 5. And again, I'm reading from the Message Bible today. So if you want to get that out and uh, follow along, it's going to say just about the same thing in any other translation, but I'm reading today from the Message Bible. And we're starting with 1 John 5. And we're going to start with verse 11. We're going to go reading through verse 20. Maybe a little further, but we'll, we'll start there. Uh, this is the testimony in essence. God gave us eternal life. The life is in His Son. So whoever... Whosoever has the Son has life. Whoever rejects the Son rejects life. My purpose in writing is simple. Simply this, that you who believe in God's Son will know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have eternal life. Beyond a shadow of a doubt that you'll have eternal life. The, re the reality and not the illusion. And how bold and free we then become in His presence, freely asking according to His will, sure that He's listening. And if we're confident that He's listening, we know that what we've asked for is as good as ours. For instance, if we see a Christian believer sinning, clearly not talking about those who make a practice of sin that in a way is fatal, leading them to eternal death, we ask for God's help and He gladly gives it gives life to the sinner whose sin is not fatal. There is such a thing as a fatal sin, and I'm not urging you to pray about that, and I'm not urging you to pray about that. Everything we do wrong is sin, but not all sin is fatal. We know that none of the God-begotten make this practice of sin fatal sin. The God-begotten are also the God-protected. The evil one can't lay a hand on them. We know that we are held firm by God. It's only the people of the world who continue to grab of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God came so that we could recognize and understand the truth of God. What a gift. And we are living in that truth itself in God's Son, Jesus Christ. This Jesus is both true God and real life. Dear children, be on guard against all clever facsimiles. You know, I, when, I, when I started this series about the book of John, I don't know how many of you know it, John wrote also the Gospel of John. He wrote these books, the little mini books here of the books of John, and he also wrote the book of Revelation. How many of you have ever delved into the book of Revelation? So we also have to understand that this man was the closest disciple that Jesus had. This is the man who would from time to time actually was so intimate with Jesus that he would lay his head on the chest of Jesus and relax and be right there. And Jesus would allow that. He was so intimate and so close so that when we read these scriptures, these are coming from the human being that was the closest friend that Jesus had alive. So as we understand that, we have also an understanding that we've talked about it before that uh, John was writing to a group of people that are second and third generation after the death of Christ. He's been gone. This writing is happening about 90 AD, the historians tell us. So Jesus died and we've had a group of people come on board that had you know, relatives that probably saw him and then now we're talking about grandparents that saw him but grandchildren that never did. And it's pretty much like that today in the fact that we're talking to a group of people that really never saw him, never really able to, to be with him. But John was there. He was, in fact, an eyewitness, not only to the person of who Jesus was, but to all the things that Jesus did while he was here. So I want us to kind of keep that in the back of our mind. As I was talking to uh, Pastor Julius in, in Kenya this morning, 
he was asking me what our economy was like. And, uh, you know, I, I had to think about, you know, what, where he was coming from. He was talking about the fact that food was scarce for them. Drinking water is scarce for them. That uh, they have not had good rains. The grass is crisp and their cattle, for the most part, are having difficulty finding food. And he asked how it was here, and I wanted to tell him, well, the grass is dry here too. But I couldn't tell him that. I couldn't tell him that, you know, we abound in food. And we complain about $4 a gallon for gasoline, and they're walking five miles to get to church. So I had very little to tell him other than the fact that I told him that God was going to supply all of his needs and that we're going to help. But I think in our world today, it's so unpredictable. And the thing that I want us to take a look at is the comparison of between today and what John was talking about then. Uh, we have government getting their minds and eyes and fingers into all kinds of things here. Same thing was going on there. We have to understand that at the same time, uh, Rome had come in and destroyed the temple. Things of Christian belief or of organized religion was being crushed. We had the worship of pagan gods, and we've got the worship of pagan gods here. Uh, much the same, we have all kinds of idols. You can watch them on TV, whether they're singing or talent. It's all about idol worship. You know, let's vote for our idol. Well, there's the same thing going on there. You know, who are we going to lift up? The same kind of things were going on during the same time period. False teachers were infiltrating the church, claiming that enlightenment, not faith, mattered. Secret truths and mystical experiences were the rave, and you see that same thing going on. We have a lot of parallels going on today. A lot of churches that are coming into being that have no Christian foundation. Same thing going on here today that was going on here. So we see a lot of comparisons, and that was, that's what I want us to kind of take a look at today. How many of you have ever seen a $3 counterfeit $3 bill? Anybody seen a counterfeit, a counterfeit $3 bill? It's hard to see a counterfeit $3 bill when there's not a real one. Now, I know some of you have been, you know, kind of compared to those $3 bills. Gay is a $3 bill. But the whole point is, is that you don't see a counterfeit $3 bill because there's not one. But I know we've got people that are in banking here today that have probably seen counterfeit 20s. I've seen counterfeit 20s when we were taking up offerings many times uh, when we were doing these big huge meetings with thousands of people there, we would occasionally come across counterfeit bills. Now, I don't know if the person giving it knew that it was a counterfeit or if they were just, you know, ignorantly passing it on, naively passing it on, but we would get them in there. And you can, after a while, begin to tell the difference in the paper and the ink and everything like that by handling them a lot. We have counterfeit churches going on today that have very close similarities of what is the real church. And John had to put up with those two. And he's beginning to talk about that. People were questioning, well, how do I know that I'm really saved? How do I know that, that what I know about Jesus Christ, because I'm so far removed from him, and I'm thinking about far removed from him, you got 50 years away. I mean, we're talking, you know, two centuries away here. How do we really know that what we believe is the truth? And how do we know that what those other people out there preaching in their churches and have all their stuff going on aren't really the true church and we're the counterfeit? How do we really know? And John was having to deal with that here with these people as well. You know, I know a lot of times while people have always struggled with doubt in our today postmodern 21st century world, it seems harder than ever to be sure of anything. Diamonds that look real are really not. I mean, they have all the characteristics of a diamond, CZs. But it takes somebody who really has knowledge to know what that really is and being able to test that stone to ensure that it's really true. There was a new president of Harvard inaugurated a few months ago. Her name is Drew Faust. Now, I want to read you a quote from her inaugural speech. Now, everyone's heard of Harvard. If you haven't, you will. 
you're growing up, you've never heard of Harvard. I, you know, I, Yale and Harvard were principal schools. They were built on Christianity. Their foundation was Christian beliefs. You go back and look at their early document papers and how they were assigned. They were built on Christian principles and beliefs, just like what we have in this church. But this is what the president, the new president of Harvard, made a statement in her inaugural address. She said, truth is an aspiration, not a possession. And she said, we challenge those who would embrace such certainties. And I began to think about that. You know, here is the most intellectual school in the country who's being led now by a woman who says that if you have any certainties in life, we challenge that. Well, I'm here today to tell you that I have a certainty in life. I have a certainty. And I don't care what preacher, what background, denomination, or group of people can come to me and say, I'm not going to heaven. Because I have a challenge to them. I know I'm going to heaven. I don't believe I'm going to heaven. I know I'm going to heaven. And today what I want to share with you is what John shares here is so important for us as a community to know. So let's take a look here. John wants you to know a couple of things. First off, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know. Everybody say no. no. That you have eternal life. He wants you to know that you have eternal life. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you believe or do you know that you're sitting in that chair, Doug? Do you believe or do you know that you're sitting there? You know you're sitting there. How do you know? You're not on the floor. Believing is something that is coming to pass. Knowing is something that is already in existence. I know that I'm going to heaven. You have come too late to tell me I'm not. Because I know I'm going. So let's take a look. He says that the word here in the Greek says, no is found more in this one chapter. This one chapter. The word no is found in this chapter more times than all of the rest of the New Testament combined. That's how important he's stressing this, that we know where we're going, where our end result is. We've got to know this. Know is the state of knowledge rather than the process. Rather than the process. He says, and I would say, I know I'm standing here. I don't have to believe it because I'm standing here. You don't have to worry about believing that you're sitting there because it's already past the point of believing. Now, the believing part would have been sitting down on these originally, whether or not they were going to be found sound enough for us to be sitting. But we do know that we're sitting here. We do know that we're here today. John wants us to know three things. You might want to write these down. Very clever. John, John has a tendency to tell us what he's going to tell us, then he tells us, then he tells us what he told us. First off, John wants us to know that we have a possibility of eternal life. He's giving and representing that. He's saying, you know what? We have the potential of life eternal. Real life. He makes a statement in so many words. He says, I want you to live life and to long to live. You know, I remember 15 years ago, 15 years plus now, it'll be 16 years, that the doctor told me that I had six to nine months to live. And I wanted to live longer than that. I told them, I told that oncologist that I wanted to live to see all of my kids graduate from high school. I wanted to live long enough to see all of my kids graduate from college. I wanted to see my kids walk down the aisle. I wanted to be walking them down the aisle. And I've added to that and I wanna see all of my grandchildren graduate from high school. I'm continuing to stretch that on out there. Now, five years later, 10 years later, 15 years later, they can say, you know, well, you're just a fluke. No, I know God healed me. That is not a fluke. 
we have to understand that life that we have given to us is something that we can have a quality of and a quantity of. John said, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may as prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. He wants us to prosper. He says in this book, he says, I want you to have life abundance and I want you to have an abundance of life. Two different things. Life eternal started the day you said that prayer and you invited Jesus to come into your heart. It doesn't happen when you die. You are already in eternal life. You will live forever. Maybe not in this body, but your spirit is going to live forever. Second thing he says, John also wants us to know that it is life that is found in Jesus Christ. You cannot find eternal life in any other element. You can't find eternal life in yourself. Mm, meditating is not going to get you there. Worshiping cows is not going to get you there. The only thing that is going to get you there is your life found in Jesus Christ. And that means you've got to have a relationship with Him. A relationship is only going to be the way that you're going to find that. Now, I've got a relationship with my partner. I've got a relationship with my children. I had a relationship with my parents. I have a relationship with my friends. But that's not who he's talking about. This is a different kind of relationship. You know, I trust all of those people to an extent. Mark, since he's gone, maybe a little less than others. <laughs> But what happens is we learn to trust people because we are in a relationship with them. But the relationship that we're talking about here, there is no doubt in that relationship. There is no mistrust in that relationship. Because every day there is a wonderful new way of life every single day with him. He said it's not something to be found inside us. In the world it's to be found in him. Jesus brought his life to us so that we could see how to live that life through him. The good news is he showed us that, you know what? We shouldn't have a care in this world. Every day, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that every day Jesus wondered about the gas prices. I don't see that he wondered about where the food was coming from. I see that when there was a need beyond himself to take care of the people, he took what was given to him and he multiplied it. I have seen food go long ways that I had no idea how that was going to happen. Because God seems to come in and multiply things. It's like that plate of spaghetti. When you go to dinner and you get that spaghetti and you've eaten and eaten and eaten and eaten and you wonder where is it coming from? It seems like it's growing in the plate. Everything that we have, God will multiply that because he wants us to understand his kind of life has an abundance about it. But we've got to find that life in him. The third thing is, John wants us to know that if you have the son, Jesus, you have life. Not just any life, but his life. You know, I kind of thought about that. And I thought about the fact that... Uh, there have been times when I have, I have trusted people and they have let me down. How many of you have ever had that happen? People said they were going to do things and they didn't do it. Had every intention to do it, well-meaning. I had people here that promised me they were going to be at church today because they had nothing else today. And that was just last night. I mean, from last night, I said, I'm going to ask him, who died? You know, what happened? Did there, was there a train wreck? Because I think when you give your word, I think you should be like the old saying is, as good as your word. Right? The problem is, people aren't as trustworthy as God, our Heavenly Father is. Who, when he sent his son to save us, he did exactly what he said he was going to do. So, I think it's really important to find out that, you know what, I'm glad that Dr. Faust, the head of... Harvard had nothing to do with the Bible. She wasn't able to write in there that you couldn't trust people, that there were no certainties in life. But you know what? There are. There are.
How many of you saw the movie Hereafter with Matt Damon? How many of you went to see it? Let me see your hands. Hands, 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 hands. Okay. I thought it was very interesting. I went to see that movie because I wanted to see what they had to say. You know, what did, what did the secular world have to say about the hereafter? And I thought it was interesting. You know, Matt Damon's character is a psychic in this movie. And he, he connects with people. And I'm going, oh, this is so bad for people to be seeing this. Because, you know, it, a la Shirley MacLaine channeling and talking to the dead, which is no one do that because you can't don't do it anyway. Uh, the only person in the Bible that ever did that ended up dying the next day. So take that as a warning. Necromancy is not something you want to get involved in. Anyway, so he is communicating with the dead and the people wanted to ask these two very important, all important questions. One, what is it like on the other side? Two, is there something we should be doing now on this side so that we can get to the other side? When those questions were asked, all of the crackle, the pop, this, this, the wrappers, the popcorn, everything stopped. It was as silent in that room, you could have heard a pin drop because everybody was waiting to hear what Matt Damon said was on the other side. Why didn't they ask me? I know. <laughs> I could have told them. I wanted to shout out, life is on the other side. I wanted to, but I was afraid I'd be carried out. <laughs> life is on the other side. Life is here. Is there anything we have to do here to get over there? If you're born again, you've already done it. There is nothing more you can do. Nothing you have to do. You don't have to lay awake at night wondering if I die tonight, what's going to happen to me? I had that told to me my whole life as a child. Now, what would happen to you if you were to be killed on the way home from church tonight? You had a chance to be saved tonight. What would happen to you? Well, I don't know. They create this doubt, this uncertainty, hoping that you'll keep your life straight. Well, you know what? God's not like that. God's not one that inks you along, hoping that you're good enough, that finally when you die, uh, he was just a little short. God's not like that. God gives us an understanding that when our life comes into his life and we begin to share a relationship with him, that I don't have to worry any more about what's going to happen. According to John, eternal life is possible. It's found in Jesus Christ. And if, big if, you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have already eternal life. But there is that if there. But if you've already accepted him, there is no wondering, there is no uncertainty you can stand up to the world's critics and say, you know what? I don't care what you say. Your word has no power. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you know what? Mine's already confessing it. So nothing you say can change that. You need to know on the inside of you that you have that relationship with him. A spiritual journey that we're talking about, that John's talking about and alluding to in this book, has four steps. One, he starts off in the gospel. We talked about the gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the look of Jesus while he was here on earth, one of the four. It talks about hearing. Faith comes by what? And hearing by what? Okay, so our journey begins by hearing, understanding the life and the message of Jesus Christ. When we begin to hear that, things begin to change on the inside of us. And we begin to have uh, our eyes open to the possibility there, there could be something after this world. And if there is, then it's a good thing. The next step is believing, putting your trust in the life and the message of Jesus Christ. So we hear it, and then we begin to say, you know, I, I, I can trust that. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. But the next step after believing is start to living like it's true. Not just trusting Christ, but following Him every single day. 
living your faith day by day, you enter into the final phase of this journey, which is knowing, understanding and having complete confidence that you are a child of God, both now and forever. I was in a room one time and my in-laws were there and it was real interesting. They were talking about several of the books that they had written and, and they wrote a total of over 60 books together in their life and all of them are meaningful to a Christian by every means. And people were talking about the fact, well, I, I'd like to be a writer. You know, I, what, what, what does it take to be a writer? And my mother-in-law, only like she could tell, it's like a job. You get up in the morning, you sit down at the desk, and you sit there and you write all day. And then when it's five, you get up and you leave. You eat, and if you're still inspired, you sit back down and you write some more. And there were times in their lives that that writing got in the middle of our relationship and the relationship with their children and their grandchildren. Because we had a trip when, when I only had the first two little girls we were on our way, the car was packed up, and my father-in-law called and said, don't come, we're in the middle of writing this book. We can't have any interruption. At the time, my wife took that very, very difficult because she wanted to go, we were all packed up, the kids were ready, we were all this stuff, and we were on the car on the way, and it hurt her to the bone. But that's because it was their job. They knew that that was a job. What does it take being a writer it's doing that job every single day. What does it take to be a Christian? Doing what you do every single day, not just once a week. Not just coming to church once a week and say, well, I'm a church goer. That's what you would be if you went to church once a week. But if you're going to be a believer, you're going to be a Christian, you're going to be someone that knows and has a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to be doing that every single day. Not because you have to, but, but it's because you're in a relationship with someone that is going to take you through eternity. The other day, a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> I hate to almost mention this, some of, every, some of those folks are out of here so I can talk about them. Uh, Johnny and Todd and Kidder and Tim and my partner and I, Mark and I, decided, well, we invited these four guys to go on a little day trip with us down to a place called the Lily Farm. Well, this Lily Farm is down by Nacogdoches. How many of you know where Nacogdoches is? Well, I know generally where that is. And uh, from here, I really wouldn't know how to get there. But thank God for GPSs and maps. Well. I had a general idea that we had to go out 20, we were gonna go out 20, and somewhere along the way, the GPS was gonna tell us to turn right. Well, we got out there in the middle of East Texas and the GPS just didn't work. <laughs> are we surprised? You know, so we get out there and the GPSs are not working, and so we're looking for all the right roadsides. So Todd's got his maps up, and he's saying, well, we could turn here, well, that, well, that one. <laughs> well, we could turn, oh, that one, that one. And we're watching these roads go by that we could all turn to go right to go on down towards Center, Texas. Center, Texas is 30 miles uh, east, northeast of Center, of Nacogdoches. So it's out in the middle of nowhere. But we struck out. We were all having a pretty good time. Pretty good time. We were all laughing and giggling and having a good time. Six of us guys, uh, five guys and Mark. Anyway, so <laughs> we, were, we were there and having this good time. And uh, we made a turn and we decided we were going to take this turn and it was going to go pretty good. Well, we were still wondering because the GPS was still not picking us up. And we really had no idea what road we were on because there were no road signs. And we were just headed south. I could see it on there. We were, we we're headed in the right direction. We we're going south. Well, on the inside of me, I began to get a little nervous <laughs> because uh, no one really had a good idea where we were headed. We knew where the destination was, but we really had no right idea if we were on our way or not. And we finally got to Nacogdoches, and I felt a little sense of calm come over because I recognized the streets, we'd been there before, everything was cool, we were gonna drive right through town, and we were gonna go out to the Daylily Farm. Now, I will tell you, if you've never been, and I guarantee you that only probably six of us have ever been to the Daylily Farm, there's only three of these in the whole country. This is where 
these national and internationally known hybridists are, and they hybrid daylilies that you have never even imagined in your life. Some of them are called megatrons that are like five and six feet tall daylilies that are all colors of the rainbow. They're not just the little gold ones that you see in the medians. These, those are like a dime a dozen. These are several hundred dollars per fan for little legs. So we went down to this place and we were going and we got on the right road and it's between two cities and Mark and I are looking at the map and we're watching and we're watching and we're watching and we're watching and I'm getting, I'm, I'm really getting nervous again because I've got four of the people that I really admire a lot in the car with me, your other four pastors in the car. Kathy was not anywhere to be found. Anyway, so all of us are there and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed by the fact that we can't seem to find this place and then suddenly over this hill the carpenter daylily farm and there was this I looked over at Mark and Mark and I had this big sigh of <sighs> because we knew we were there we'd been on this journey but we finally knew it was there you see you've been on this journey all your life but you really never did know until what John tells us right here that you don't have to wonder anymore if you're going to get there or not. You don't have to question whether or not you're going to get to heaven or not. You've always had those little doubts in the back of your mind whether or not those people could really be true. Could they really have a better insight than us? And I'm here to tell you, John is the one that's telling us, not these people. John is the one who laid his head on the master's chest. John is the one who saw all the miracles happen. John is the one who saw him die and come again. John saw him depart. I have John's word. That if I am in relationship with Jesus Christ, I don't have to wonder anymore. Because I can know that I'm going to heaven. So let's talk about this roadmap. Four things. Hearing, believing, living, and knowing. Hearing. Investigating the life and the teaching of Jesus Christ. Do you know that and do you know that you have already investigated that? And yes, the answer is yes. Two. Believe that Jesus is real. Come to bring you life. Yes, I believe that. Three, start living your faith. Start living out loud the fact that this is what you believe. Yes. Growing in knowledge, giving yourself to others unselfishly, just like Jesus did. He gave us an example how to live. That's the way we're supposed to live. Then four, then get up every morning. Let me just tell you something. Get up every morning of your life knowing who you are not what others tell you you are. But get up every morning knowing who you are and realizing the fact that none of those people can ever change what this says. Because I like what John said at the very end of this book. He said, he who adds to or takes away from this book, I will add to them all the plagues of the Egyptians. So when those people begin to say things that are there, that are not there, don't want to be around those folks. Don't want to be around them. You can know today, if you are, if you, if you, if you are in relationship with Jesus Christ, beyond a shadow of a doubt, no uncertainties, that if you were to drop dead today, that you would be instantly in the presence of of our Heavenly Father. You would be seated right at the right hand next to Jesus, right there with Him. No question. And once you find yourself in that knowing stage, you have no reason to worry or to lay awake at night wondering, am I, am I okay with God? Because you can know you're okay. 
join hands with somebody next to you this morning. Heavenly Father, we do know because we are in relationship with you. And Heavenly Father, if there's someone who is not in that relationship with you, who, who's come here today to, to, to go to church and to be a part of a fellowship here of believers, and they're challenged today, maybe they don't know him the way that John's talking about here, then I invite you to know him. And the way you do that is you just simply ask him to come and be a part of your life. I want every person in this room to say this prayer with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I open the door to my heart and I invite you to come in. Take control of the throne of my life and make me the kind of person that you want me to be. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me today. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, at that very moment, you became from the old corruptible to incorruptible. Your life changed from just being a mere mortal to immortal. You became like Him at that very moment. You don't have to wonder anymore because you have the same life that He came to show you how to live. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming to Crossroads today. And if you're coming to the fellowship afterwards, join us. We're going to have a great time. God bless you. And thank you for coming to Crossroads today. Bless you.